Hey everyone, so this week we are reading Rudyard Kipling's The Jungle Books, um, a collection of stories that probably most of you are aware of thanks to Disney and other adaptations. Um, maybe things have changed, but I know that um, Jungle Books was all over when I was growing up, um, even despite the fact that my mom had about half a dozen Disney films that I wasn't allowed to watch at home because of racist scenes and depictions, um, Jungle Books being included, um, I still somehow managed to see it dozens of times, probably at friends' houses. So this might be a basic premise that you're very familiar with, um, thanks to the adaptations that... Um, you grew up with and that have been coming out in recent years. Um, so in today's lecture, I'd like to focus on the Jungle Books as children's literature. And then tomorrow I want to provide some background information about Britain and India, and I'd like us to focus on issues of race and colonialism in the Jungle Books um, through the supplementary material that I will provide. Kipling's own childhood began in India. His father was an art professor in Bombay, and for the first several years of Kipling's lives, he was raised by Indian nurses um, and would, into adulthood, recall the stories and the folklore that they told him. British parents believed that the air in India was dangerous for children. Um, cholera was typical. Um, tropical diseases were common. And so they tended to send their children to school in England and to be raised in England. Um, Rudyard Kipling and his sister would live in England for over a decade. Um, pardon me, before um, Kipling would return to India when he was 16 years old. And at that time, he began to work for British newspapers in India. This period was the beginning of Kipling's life as an author as well. Um, he would write, he would publish stories, and he began to earn money from royalties. So after a while, he moved to London in order to pursue literary writing as a career. Although Kipling would spend most of his adult life then um, between England and then also the United States, his experiences in India remain crucial both to his literature and to his politics. And we'll talk more about that and especially the political side of things in tomorrow's lecture. Today, though, I want to talk about the growth of children's literature in Victorian England and a little bit about how we might see um, jungle books fitting into that. As long as stories have been told, there have been stories that are told to children, of course, um, but throughout much of Western history, these stories have been primarily um, folklore, fairy tales, and religious stories. One thing that you might note between these three genres is that traditionally we think of each form um, or each of them as a form of a moral story, a story that communicates a culture's values, which sometimes is meant to instruct children, help develop a sense of right and wrong, and instill other cultural values. In the 19th century, a few things were happening that made children's literature develop and grow. Some major factors included um, the steam-powered printing press, which enabled um, publishing, especially of periodicals, to increase significantly, as well as um, postal reform that enabled wide distribution of literary periodicals. Um, children's periodicals were um, very popular by the middle of the 19th century. The stories in them sometimes focused on the development of moral principles, um, but they also often told of adventure throughout the British Empire. Um, Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, for example, is a story that began in a Victorian children periodical that's still popular today, and it's all about a young boy going out and experiencing um, the world on the seas um, and implicitly the British Empire. Um, so in this way, we can see that children's literature not only instructed children about right and wrong, but try to um, instill in them a sense of adventure, um, encourage their creativity, and while doing that, I also think it sought to show them the qualities of a good English person. Um, things like a sense of adventure tempered with a sense of responsibility, um, the ability to travel and rule the non-Western world. 
Um, furthermore, by the end of the 19th century, there was a growing anxiety um, about the fact that perhaps boys and girls who at that time were raised to develop different traits should not be raised under the influence of the same literature. So by the end of the century, I just wanted to note, there were many more periodicals focusing exclusively on telling stories that helped boys learn how to be boys and girls learn how to be girls. If you think through um, popular children's literature that you've read, you might notice a few patterns, and I want to speak to one, which is namely, where are the parents? Um, in Victorian children's literature, children are often orphans or somehow otherwise removed from the constraints that parents put on them. So to return to the example of Treasure Island again, Jim Hawkins' father dies, so he's free to go on adventures, sailing the seas, searching for treasure, fighting pirates. If you're familiar with the story of Peter Pan, um, early 20th century story, the Ruption family is extremely central and explicit. Um, the parents might not leave the children, but the Pardon me, children very intentionally leave their parents and must do so in order to have their adventure in Neverland. This is a pattern that we often see even in children's literature today. Whether or not the parents are dead, the setup for the story in some way often writes them away, whether it be because the parents are neglectful or often absent, because the main character is out of town with friends or other relatives, or because one or both parents is, you know, missing, gone, dead, um, whatever the case may be in any given story. And, well, um, I say this noting recent events, many of us might not be the author's biggest fan over recent years, um, it's worth noting how the Harry Potter series highlights this trend on several levels. Um, Harry, of course, is an orphan, but Hermione, um, too, has a unique level of independence because her muggle parents aren't aware of the realities of the wizarding world. Um, she has that sort of, um, rupture from them being um, literally in a different world than them. Um, and all of the children in those stories are able to go off and have the adventures that they have because they've all been sent a, um, away to school, away from the watchful eyes of their parents. Um, Harry Potter is just one example, but I'm sure that if you think through the stories that you grew up with, that you enjoyed reading and watching as a child, you can find others that have... Um, a similar pattern. In stories such as these and such as the Jungle Books, the absence of parents in some ways is a helpful plot device. Um, writing away the cautioning force and the sense of security that the main character might feel with parents allows for greater adventure, yes. But it's also worth noting the effect that can have on character psychology and theme. A child who either is alone or feels alone goes through a process of de developing self-reliance, self of sense, and maturation. And thematically, especially in a story about empire, it's not hard to imagine how those traits parallel Victorian Britain's own vision of itself. So I'm going to leave you there, and we will pick up with empire on um, Tuesday with the supplementary readings. Thanks so much, everyone. See you later. Bye.